Okay, here is a simplified block diagram of the DSS 930. And I want to use it to illustrate some of the changes I want to be making to improve the acoustic quality of this loudspeaker. So the signal path for audio is audio comes in here to the audio IC, audio digital IC, goes through the DSP, goes through the digital volume control, through the D2A converter into the amplifier to the speakers. And I think in this signal path there is a bottleneck. The transceiver and the audio digital IC are able to handle word lengths of more than 16 bits, but are currently capped to 16 bits on the circuit board. The reason for that is that the DSP here can only handle 16 bits. And that's the problem of the technology in 1992, I suppose. DSP ran at 27 megahertz, it was six points. There was not much it could do. Um, but there's a problem with this. If the sound goes out in 16 bits, it has a dynamic range of 96 dB, and it goes straight into the volume control. And what the volume control is going to do, the digital volume control anyway, it's, it's actually a hybrid volume control, um, but it's partly digital, and every time it is uh, reducing by 6 dB, it's chopping one bit of the effective dynamic range. But that's not great, because the number 16 that I draw here is actually the most optimal number. That is the number of bits of resolution that the DSP has. But actually, um, the precision will be less than 16 dB because the DSP internally has words of 16 bit and coefficients of 12 bits, and it's making rounding errors. So by the time it's done processing the audio, we will effectively have lost a few bits of those 16 and we'll probably be dealing with 14 bit audio. Then if we reduce another, let's say 30 dB, of volume control, we lose another five bits, and now we're dealing with eight bit audio. And I've heard this. If you turn up the analog part of the volume control and reduce the digital part, you will hear at the end of the song that the noise as the song is fading out is very quantized and, and it, it sounds absolutely bad. What is that we can do? The digital volume control is actually happening in the upsampler chip, and that's a, an SM5840. That chip has a fixed input range of 16 bits. So even if we replace the DSP here and go from 16 bits to uh, 32 bits or 24 or whatever we want to do, it won't make a difference because this upsampler chip will only read 16 bits. And after its work, it has expanded that to 20 bits, but the effective resolution still is 16 bits. What we have to do not only replace the DSP, but we also have to replace the upsampler chip. And I found an upsampler chip, the SM5840. Which has 20 bits of input dynamic range. And that would actually do a lot better. I think this then can be 20 or even more, but we will have 20 bits of resolution. It's not ideal because theoretically we could be making 32, but let's say that the DSP produces 20 bits of resolution with a proper dithering. And then the final step will be to configure the audio IC to receive 20 bits as well. Now, throughout the entire signal chain, we'll have 20 bits at least of digital dynamic range which is 120 dB when we go into the amplifiers. So that's the game plan. Um, we'll be taking it one step at a time. But first, we have to go into this entire circuit and figure out how this is all done. So here we have the microprocessor. It's talking to the volume control IC, the SM5843, but it's also talking to the DSP, which is why I said this block diagram is not entirely uh, complete. And the microprocessor tells the DSP, for instance, this input signal is stereo, which one of the channels to process and send to the tweeter and the woofer. It also tells the DSP what the current volume is, because the DSP will change the gain of the base by quads and some other stuff, dependent on the volume setting. These two communication lines need to be analyzed, understood, 
because if we replace the upsampler here, the new upsampler needs to speak the same language. And if we replace the DSP, the DSP also needs to speak the same language. And finally, what we need to understand is the actual DSS link signal itself, not for improving the loudspeaker, but in order to be able to talk to the outside world. There are not that many DSS loudspeakers around anymore, but maybe we would like to make a subwoofer. And then we have to be able to speak from the microprocessor to other loudspeakers. So this DSS link also needs to be reverse engineered. This um, shift register interface, where you put data in and you latch them in with the clock pulses, and then at the end with the latch command, you send it out. I am decoding it in the scope by using the spy decoder, but it's not entirely correct. So I think you have to chop off the last bit. Also, you can see here, because it's a synchronous command, in contrary to, let's say, the DSS commands or the UART commands, because it's synchronized by the clock, the, when the clock stops, you can stop the data. So it, it really does look like bit banging here. Um, at this point, the processor is apparently busy doing something else, so it just stops the MCK and then starts clocking out when it's got time again. And here I've decoded the bits by taking the spy decoder, chopping off the, the last one. And it's starting up, it gives you three volume commands. Must be a little bit confused. But the interesting thing is here. So it, this is actually the configuration register where it says the serial audio serial format is the normal one and um, not the uh, right aligned or something. So it, it's normal serial mode. The LR clock polarity is left channel low, which means it's inverting the LR clock. It sets the chip to 8FS, parallel left right outputs. It sets the output word length to 20 bits and it turns the noise shaper on. So, And then there's a second configuration command where it tells it to set the output mode to stereo. Doesn't use the F cell, turns the emphasis on, uh, off, and the mute off. So these two lines essentially set up the chip for its entire life. And then the volume commands is repeated again. And these volume commands I've plotted here. So it's quite interesting to take a look at that. So it starts at 7F, 7E, 7D. So it's, it's clearly slowly ramping down. And you would think that it slowly ramps to zero, but it doesn't. So it ramps down to 1B, then it goes to 1, then it goes up to 43, 32 again, comes down to 5, jumps back up to 40. It looks like this volume control is very nonlinear, and I've plotted it, and you see that, okay, this, this was the absolute mute. So the volume starts ramping up from minus 40 dB all the way up to 0 dB, and then it jumps down by 8 dB. And what you have to bear in mind is when the volume control here jumps down by another 8 dB, this is when the microcontroller switches a transistor stage on on the board, which is adding 8 dB of analog gain. So the digital ramps down, the analog gains up by 8 dB, then the intermediate steps are made by the digital again until we're at maximum value. Then we add more analog volume, so we jump down by digital volume and do the steps again. We add more analog volume again, and that's why you have this sawtooth here. Every time we ramp down in the sawtooth, we add analog gain. So it's a hybrid volume control. I've written blog articles about this, that this really isn't necessary anymore. But in 1992 it was, and with 16-bit, it probably really is necessary to add some analog volume control. So for the time, I think it's a very elegant solution. But at least we have now verified that the system volume is always applied by the upsampler. And also, we now know the complete upsampler configuration, which will be very useful if we want to actually replace the upsampler. And that's enough spoilers for the next episode. Here we're looking at the um, DSP to host and host to DSP communications on a cold boot up. And you will see that DSP to host is not terribly insightful. The DSP apparently does its own booting thing and then sets this pin high to tell the host, I'm ready for you. And the host probably does a similar thing. 
it starts up, glitches a few times, has a cup of coffee, boots, and then that's its GPIO high. And then it sends a series of telegrams. And when you zoom into those, it's only a one wire protocol, so it couldn't be anything that exciting. So looking at the pulse widths, I figured out that the timing is about 41,666666 bytes per second. And that's good enough for short UART commands. It doesn't need a clock for synchronization. You just trigger off this line going down, and then you read 8 bits, and Bob's your uncle. After some fiddling around with the parameters here, putting them backwards and forwards, I arrived at LSB first. And I'll show you why I think that's the right way to read this. And then, of course, the next question is, what do these commands mean? So you here have a series of six telegrams. The actual telegram is 12, 0, A, 0, 5, B2, 45, 25. Okay, cool. What does that mean? The way to decode this is to do it again and again and again and change some system variables on the system and then figure out what changes in the telegrams. So in this spreadsheet, I've done the same thing a few times. I've started it up on left channel setting. I've started the speaker up set to the right channel and I've started it up set to the sum channel. And then you start to see that you get very similar command protocols, but some things change. In this case, we always get a 12. So, um, I later on found out that this is an initialization or reset command, but in the beginning we'll just ignore this. What changes here is the second telegram, which is 0, 09, 0, A, or 0, B. So if we go back to this. So in this series of telegrams, we see that the speaker is saying it's 0, A. In other words, it's actually set to the right channel. Then we get 0, 5, which at this point you don't know, B2, 45, 25. So the only thing that changes when you mess around with the channel, is the second telegram. Okay, cool. Then we leave the speaker on the same channel and we start messing around with the value. And I found out that every time you switch it on, and it's been completely off, because the speaker has no permanent memory, it says B2. But then, if you uh, play with the remote control and you set different volume controls, you will see that it starts to walk up and down this line. And this is how I know it's LSB first, because one step down from, twin, uh, from volume 25, because all in all there are 50 volume steps, the speaker goes to B4, B6, B8, BA, BC, CE, and so on and so forth. If you did MSB first, this sequence wouldn't make any sense, but now you clearly see that the values are going up and down. Great. So we now figured out that the fourth telegram is the volume that the speaker is set to. The DSP doesn't actually apply volume to audio, but it does change the frequency response based on the volume, so it needs to know the volume. Although it really only cares about the last 12 or so commands. So then um, I took away the signal and reconnected it. So on a reconnect, the DSP needs to at least flush out the old data. It needs to know the volume again. It probably still remembers the channel. And then the 45 and the 25 is not immediately clear from here, but it cross-correlates to the decoding of the DSS signal. But these are probably unmute or just start playing and turn on the compensation. Now, I can't be sure of this because I don't have the preamp and I cannot turn the compensation off. But the speakers have an LED that shows that the frequency compensation is active. So the DSP needs to know to activate that part of the signal chain. So. I'm fairly sure it is being told to turn the compensation on. Probably if you turn it off, it, it might be a 26 or a 27 here. I don't know. At least I know that 25 is do your compensation. A little update to the serial decoding. I just realized that if you want to have an IIR biquad at 70 hertz and you want to do a proper crossover, but your digital input accepts 32 kilohertz, 44 kilohertz, or 48 kilohertz, the DSP needs to scale these parameters according to the sample rate. 
or just have three sets of parameters for each sample rate. So the DSP needs to know the sample rate. And this might be one of the commands that I'm, I've been guessing so far, but I wasn't entirely sure. So let's try this live, shall we? We've set the DSP to 48 kilohertz. We've got the DS view here. Speaker is off. We start the sampling, turn it on. There we go. 12.09.05, B2.45.25. Turning the speaker off again, we go to the audio precision. We set the sample rate to 44 kilohertz. We start the trigger, start the speaker again. What do you know? 11.09.05, B2.45.25. Everything stays the same except the first one has changed to 11. Speaker off. Audio precision to 32 kilohertz. Arm the trigger, start the speaker. 10. And the rest of the messages is all the same. So that's clear. 10 indicates 32 kilohertz. 11 indicates 44 kilohertz and 100 little hertz. And 12 is 48 kilohertz. I've already updated the spreadsheet. Now the DSS signal, the, uh, the bus that goes in between the speakers, it's a little bit more complicated. I've probed here the infrared signal, which is Philips RC5. And luckily, DSView has an integrated decoder for that. So you can look at it and you can immediately detect preamble, the synchronization bits, the toggle bit, and it even decodes the volume. So it clearly says here, I've been telling volume up. And then on the DSS bus, so I'm here I'm looking at the uh, demodulated um, DSS signal. So obviously the audio is gone and now there's just this signal here and it goes uh, da -da 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 -da. and it took me a long time to work this out and after a while i looked at it and i th saw that this was a um similar to the the um rc5 actually it's it's related to rc5 so it's a base encoding protocol which means that there is a pulse that always goes up and always goes down but if the pulse happens in the first half of the clock, so the clock is from here to here, then it's a one. And if it happens in the second half, it's a zero. It is essentially this little pulse modulated in phase. So a zero is clearly half down and half up, and a one is half up and half down. And the reason they do it like this, this is called Manchester encoding, is that for every bit, there is always a transition from high to low, which means that the signal will never stay high for a very long time. And because of this, when you try to synchronize to these bits, you will find the average signaling frequency even on a one wire line with no clock. So you don't need a clock to synchronize this data because you can essentially say that, okay, the, the, the width here varies a little bit because that's, that's the actual phase uh, that encodes the information. But the frequency is going to be as good as constant. Then, what you also need to know about these encoders is that at some point, they need to figure out, so the bus here is idle, and you need to know where the start of your packet is. And this is called a preamble. So the preamble here is four ones, and it allows the decoder to find out that there is a signal coming in and also to find the average frequency. So during this preamble, the controller can recognize, okay, there is a Manchester code coming in here, and now I will synchronize to roughly this frequency, and I will start to discriminate the phase. And that's how it finds the ones, the zeros, the ones, and the zeros. That's the first discovery I made that, okay, the DSS signal is a Manchester encoded signal. And now I know that if this is volume up, this signal here has probably all kinds of data in it, and we need to start doing the same kind of decoding that we did on the UART. Try and figure out where is the volume, um, is it trying to tell about the channels, and all this other stuff. So now if we look at a complete startup, we'll see that actually there's a lot of data coming out, and there's actually um, no less than 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 telegrams coming out. And of course, we need to somehow decode this stuff. This is where it gets fun. So the next thing I found out is that 
The first message that comes in, the first telegram, has a preamble of 1111. But then when I tried to decode the next telegrams, that actually didn't work. And it turns out that the next ones, actually the next 13, are on a different preamble, and the preamble is 1010. So you need to go into the Manchester decoder and say that you want Manchester preamble 1111 and preamble 1010. And you actually need two decoders to figure out what all this stuff means. But now that we have it, we have a binary message here in the 1111. And then we have a bunch of messages in the 1010. And you will see that all of these are decoded without errors. So this is the correct decoder. Question again is, what does all this mumbo jumbo mean? And here I got stuck again. But there is a trick here when you go into the decoder options to stack another decoder. And we go to... And we go to OOK, which is on off key and different word for Manchester decoding. And we visualize the actual words. And we set them in hex with a single length of four. And now, instead of having to copy out lots of ones and zeros into a spreadsheet and stare at them for five days, which I've done, we can actually look at bits and, and, and hex codes that come out. So here, the preamble 1111 will always decode to F. And then the actual message here is DFF. Um, let me just turn off the higher layer here. There we go. And here, the preamble 1010 will always decode to A, so we can forget about that. That's actually not a message, that's just the synchronization. So the message here is AE3D3F. And here it's B63F9797. This message says AE3F9797. And now you can see, when you actually decode these numbers, you start to recognize stuff. It's saying 9797 here, 9797 here. Here it says A63F, again, 3F, 3F, 9797. Now, I stared at this for a long while, and I came up with a scheme like this. When you change the volume, these numbers start to go up. So volume down actually turns the 9797 into 9898, 9999, 9A, 9A. It goes all the way down to AFAF because we're doing volume down. And then at minimum value, it quickly changes to BFBF. Again, if you start the speaker up cold, it goes to volume step 25. So the default volume here is 9797. You increase the volume, it goes to 9696, all the way down to 8080. And then for the last volume step, it goes up to uh, goes down to FFFF, which apparently signals that this is max volume. Now again, we look at this giant amount of um, messages, and that's here, the cold startup. So message one has a preamble of F one 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 one, and it says DFF. Just to bring it all back. Uh, that is here. So the preamble is 1111, and it says DFF. And then comes a bunch of messages in the 1010 preamble. So my current working theory is that DFF is, again, reset in it in the same way that we saw it on the UART. Then we switch over to Manchester prefix A, or preamble 1010, and we get the last 12 messages. So the first one says AE7FBF, and what I found out is if you play with the volume, because the volume is the easiest one to recognize, so we recognize the volume, then I started to change the group that the speaker is in. It's on system A, B, or C. And then we see that the byte starts with B63F, so B63F, and then you get 9797. And I think we can see that here. There you go, B63F9797. So here we are telling system A, all the loudspeakers in group A, to accept a volume command, because we're saying 3F, and then the last four are the actual volume, and in this case it's, of course, 9797, because we did a cold startup, we have no memory of our previous state, so 
what we can see here is the speaker is saying, hello, all speakers in group C, here is a volume command, and the volume will be 9797. And it does that three times. So it does it for group B6, which is group A. It does it for group AE, which is group uh, B or C. Let me see. AE is B, and then it will say A6, 3F for group C. So here's AE, 3F, 9797. And then it goes A6, so group C. 3F, here's a volume command, 9797. At this point, it starts to become very clear that this is a complete system initialization. This speaker has started up. It has decided it's the master because it's the one that recognizes an input signal. And it configures not only itself, but over the DSS bus, it tells all the other groups what to do. And then when you keep playing around like this, one of the things I did, for instance, is I just told the speaker over remote control to go into standby and it was at that point setting in group a so it says b6 hello group a and it says 7fbf so now we know that this is the standby command we go back to the startup telegrams and we see that the first thing it says is ae 7f bf ae is actually group b but it says hey come out of standby and then you look down the list and you see it does the same thing here. It says B6, which is group A, 7F, BF, out of standby. And of course, now it starts to become easy. It also says A6, group C, come out of standby. So we have three standby commands. We now have three volume commands. We also know that we need to switch the compensation on and we need to tell these speakers to unmute. When we see the command 3D, 3F, Assuming that this is compensation, because the other one is 3F, which we know from this group here to be a volume command. So 3F is a volume command. Normally you get twice the same value. I don't know why exactly, but it might just be um, some redundancy. But now you see 3F, and it happens three times, 3F, 7F, FF. So this essentially can only be something like unmute or start playing audio. Uh, why it does it in, in uh, random order, B, A, C, doesn't matter. It all happens in, uh, I think this happens in all in all, yeah, about 750 milliseconds. So who cares? So now the whole thing starts to come together. It makes sense that these are now 13 commands because there is one master reset or init. Then there are 12 actual commands, 12 commands with the prefix 1010. And those are actually four commands repeated three times for group A, B, and C. So we tell these things to come out of standby. We tell them to take the volume, in this case 25, because we're called starting up, but you will see further down the line that, of course, it remembers its value. And when you're switching from A to B to C, the speakers down the line need to be informed of the current state of all the volumes. So the whole thing is essentially stateless. The other speakers don't have to remember anything. One of these telegrams or one of these telegram groups will actually tell you all you need to know. So we bring them out of standby. We send them a volume. We tell them to turn on the DSP compensation and we tell them to stop muting. And then we have 13 commands. So we now have the whole shebang here decoded. And, and it's quite fun now that, that we can actually read it. So let's go through it again. Prefix F which is a special command. It also is used to encode a, a remote control command that is not meant for the speakers, but you can actually send remote control commands down the line. I think Philips was essentially thinking to use this DSS to connect with video recorders and what have you. We'll be nicely ignoring this. It's, it's not actually important. So FDFF or DFF means system reset. AE 3D 3F means compensation on for channel A, B uh, for, for channel C, B6, that is speaker group A, 3F, volume control 9797, AE, which is group B, volume control 907907, A6, group C, 3F, volume control 907907, then A6, which is also group C, 3D, 3F, turn your computation on, B6, 7F, BF, that is group A, unmute, play audio. AE, 7FBF, group B, unmute, play audio. So like I said before, the first command is usually one with the prefix F. 
And that is not a stateless command. That literally is just a translation of the either the remote control or in this case, it tells the whole system to reset. So if you start using the remote control buttons on the loudspeaker and you look at the telegrams. Okay, so this is one of these examples where you give a remote control and the DSS, before it emits all the 1010 uh, Manchester codes, it also emits the 1111 Manchester code, which is a translation of the volume command, but it also has channel and group encoded. Because if you send, in this case, the volume up command, only the other speakers that are in the same group are supposed to respond to the volume up command. So this translation that goes out a few milliseconds later is now combining the volume up command with the channel and the group. If you look at these commands and you decode them for preamble 1111, you see a few interesting things. So volume up is always coming out as 6EEF6F or the next time 6EEFEF. So there is a toggle bit in here which is very similar to the toggle bit in the RC5, which is here. And this is how the speaker and how, how a, a downstream device can detect that the, the button is continued to be pressed. Volume up. So let's say volume up in group A is 6EEF6F. Then we change the channel from left to right. And then when we change the volume to channel right, instead of 6E, it starts to say 6D. And when we change it to channel sum, it changes to 6C. Similarly, um, we repeat this one right here. And now we change the group from A to B to C. We see that it changes from 6 to 5 to 4. So in the beginning, there is the group encoded. Here at the end is the toggle bit. And here at the second one, it actually has the group encoded. So now if we add a visualization to this, we can see the, the preamble again is F. It says 4D EF 6F. So the remote control only says volume up. We now know that because it says 4D, we know that it's actually in group C and it's on channel right. Because the 4 comes from here and the right channel comes from here. So this packet of information actually has more in it than this one. We go down the line and we, I have all the codes for the volume down as well. I will put this spreadsheet on the website. You can download it. I have the mute button, of course. And again, muting is important to know in which group you are. So these things change as well, even though I don't think in this case, the channel that you're playing is very important, but you know, it's now a standard protocol. So it's, it's also added. So we also have the standby buttons. Obviously you can see here that I'm, I'm turning off system A while I am still in six, which means I am in group A, but I would also be able to turn off system B, even though I am in system A, which means that my system keeps running because I'm, I'm a six here, but the eight here tells the speakers on channel B turn off. So I think essentially when you're sitting in a room with loudspeakers A and your child is playing in his own room on loudspeakers B, you can actually turn them off from room A. As a parent, I appreciate this function. And these are all the buttons I have on the remote control that do anything. So these are all the commands I can decode. Again, these are all the commands I can decode with preamble one. They are not stateless. They literally say volume up. It doesn't tell you what the absolute volume is. In order to read the absolute volume, you have to go to the preamble A or 1010 Manchester decoding. And there it will tell you the absolute system state. So there's a bunch of stuff coming out. As soon as you press a remote control button, the remote control is encoded with system ABC channel LR sum and sent out on the preamble 1111. And then the actual current system state, which has no history, which is just absolute, is uh, transmitted in the 1010 preamble. And you can just apply that directly to your uh, MCU and your DSP. So the information is actually very complete. There's the command and the state being transmitted. And um, 
that's where the different preambles come in, I suppose. So, this doesn't tell you how to build a Manchester decoder, but I'm sure there's a couple of frameworks, so we'll cross that bridge when we get there. At least now we know what to decode and what it all means.